Okay, looks like we're all here and we're continuing on the five hindrances and the theme for the winter retreat is Dhamma Nupasana Satipatthana, the fourth foundation of mindfulness. And there's a, uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta Majjhima Kaya 10, it says, how is a bhikkhu abide contemplating dhammas as dhammas? Here bhikkhu abides contemplating dhammas as dhammas in terms of the five hindrances, in terms of the five khandhas, in terms of the six sense bases, in terms of the seven factors of enlightenment, in terms of the four noble truths. So we'll be going through each of these categories and now we're on the five hindrances category. And yesterday was a question brought up about the Pali for the five hindrances. So I just would like to let people know that Pali for each of them, sensual desire is Kama Chanda, ill will is Bia Pada, sloth and torpor is uh, compound word Tina Mida, Restlessness and worry is udacha, kukucha, and doubt is wicha kicha. And to start off, I'll be reading from the Sangyutta Nikaya, uh, translated by Bhante Sujato, about about the five hindrances, but it's also about the value of paying attention and listening attentively to Dhamma. This is 46, Sanyutikaya 46, 38. Mendicants, there are these five obstacles and hindrances, corruptions of the heart that weaken wisdom. What five? Sensual desire, ill will, dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and remorse, and doubt. These are the five obstacles and hindrances, corruptions of the heart that weaken wisdom. There are these seven awakening factors that are not obstacles, hindrances, or corruptions of the mind. When developed and cultivated, they lead to the realization of the fruit of knowledge and freedom. What seven? The awakening factors of mindfulness, investigation of principles, energy, rapture, tranquility, immersion, and equanimity. These seven awakening factors are not obstacles, hindrances, or corruptions of the mind. When developed and cultivated, they lead to the realization of the fruit of knowledge and freedom. Uh, so you, where, what's that source that you mean? Uh, Sanyutika 46, 30, oh, Bhante Sujata. Oh, okay. Bhante Sujato's translation. Oh, like like Immersion for concentration. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that would be samadhi. Mendicants. Sometimes a mendicant pays heed, pays attention, engages wholeheartedly, and lends an ear to the teaching. At such a time, the five hindrances are absent and the seven awakening factors are fully developed. What are the five hindrances that are absent? Sensual desire, ill will, dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and remorse, and doubt. These are the five hindrances that are absent. And what are the seven awakening factors that are fully developed? The awakening factors of mindfulness, investigation of principles, energy, rapture, tranquility, immersion, and equanimity. These are the seven awakening factors that are fully developed. Sometimes a mendicant pays heed, pays attention, engages wholeheartedly, and lends an ear to the teaching. At such a time, the five hindrances are absent and the seven awakening factors are fully developed. Now, uh, we're reading from Anguttara Kaya 10, 
tens, number 61, Ignorance, translated by Ajahn Tanisro. And seems quite appropriate for multiple reasons. One reason is that the Buddha uses a nice image of rain pouring down and water, so it seems appropriate for current conditions at Abhayagiri. Monks, a beginning point for ignorance, such that one might say, before this, ignorance did not exist. Then it came into play, cannot be discerned. This, monks, has been said. Nevertheless, it can be discerned. Ignorance comes from this condition. And I tell you, ignorance has its food and is not without food. And what is the food for ignorance? the five hindrances, it should be said. And I tell you, the five hindrances have their food and are not without food. And what is the food for the five hindrances? The three forms of misconduct. And what is the food for the three forms of misconduct? Lack of restraint of the senses. And what is the food for lack of restraint of the senses? Lack of mindfulness and alertness. And what is the food for lack of mindfulness and alertness? inappropriate attention. And what is the food for inappropriate attention? Lack of conviction. And what is the food for lack of conviction? Not hearing the true Dhamma. And what is the food for not hearing the true Dhamma? Associating with people of no integrity or not associating with people of integrity. It should be said. Thus, when not associating with people of integrity is made full, it fills the conditions for not hearing the true Dhamma. When not hearing the true Dhamma is made full, it fills the conditions for lack of conviction. When lack of conviction is made full, it fills the conditions for inappropriate attention, for lack of mindfulness and alertness, for lack of restraint of the senses, for the three forms of misconduct, for the five hindrances. When the five hindrances are made full, they fulfill the conditions for ignorance. Such is the food of this ignorance, and thus is it made full. Just as when the devas pour rain in heavy drops and crash thunder on the upper mountains, the water flowing down along the slope fills the branches of the mountain ravines and gullies. When the branches of the mountains, ravines, and gullies are full, they fill the little lakes. When the little lakes are full, they fill the big lakes, the little rivers, the big rivers. When the big rivers are full, they fill the great ocean. Such is the food of the great ocean, and thus is it made full. In the same way, when not associating with people of integrity is made full, it fills the conditions for not hearing the true Dhamma, lack of conviction, inappropriate attention, lack of mindfulness and alertness, lack of restraint of the senses, the three forms of misconduct, the five hindrances, when the five hindrances are made full, they fulfill the conditions for ignorance. Such is the food of this ignorance, and thus is it made full. Now I tell you, clear knowing and release have their food and are not without food. And what is their food? The seven factors for awakening, it should be said. And I tell you, the seven factors for awakening have their food and are not without food. And what is the food for the seven factors for awakening? the four establishings of mindfulness. And what is the food for the four establishings of mindfulness? The three forms of right conduct. And what is the food for the three forms of right conduct? Restraint of the senses. And what is the food for the restraint of the senses? Mindfulness and alertness. And what is the food for mindfulness and alertness? Appropriate attention. And what is the food for appropriate attention? Conviction. And what is the food for conviction? hearing the true Dhamma. And what is the food for hearing the true Dhamma? Associating with people of integrity, it should be said. Thus, when associating with people of integrity is made full, it fills the conditions for hearing the true Dhamma, for conviction, appropriate attention, mindfulness and alertness, restraint of the senses, the three forms of right conduct, 
the four establishings of mindfulness, the seven factors for awakening. When the seven factors for awakening are made full, they fill the conditions for clear knowing and release. Such is the food for this clear knowing and release, and thus are they made full. Just as when the devas pour rain in heavy drops and crash thunder on the upper mountains, the water flowing down along the slopes fills the branches of the mountain ravines and gullies, the little lakes, the big lakes, the little rivers, the big rivers. When the big rivers are made full, they fill the great ocean. Such is the food of the great ocean, and thus is it made full. In the same way, when associating with people of integrity is made full, it fills the conditions for hearing the true Dhamma. Conviction, appropriate attention, mindfulness and alertness, restraint of the senses, the three forms of right conduct, the four establishings of mindfulness, the seven factors for awakening. When the seven factors for awakening are made full, they fill the conditions for clear knowing and release. Such is the food for this clear knowing and release, and thus are they made full. And for the final sutta reading, <coughs> we'll read some of this Sangyutta Nikaya 46, 55 with Sangharava, translated by Bhante Sujato. And the Buddha in, in this compares, uh, sort of uses the simile of a, a bowl of water. And if the mind's clear of the hindrances, it's like a clear bowl of water and you can see your own reflection, but uh, he uses different images to this, how, how it, that bowl of water is distorted by the five hindrances. At Sawati, then Sangharava, the Brahmin, went up to the Buddha and exchanged greetings with him. When the greetings and polite conversation were over, he sat down to one side and said to the Buddha, what is the cause, Master Gotama? What is the reason why sometimes even the hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced? And why is it that sometimes even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced? Brahmin, there's a time when your heart is overcome and mired in sensual desire, and you do not truly understand the escape from sensual desire that has arisen. At that time, you do not truly know or see your own good, the good of another, or the good of both. Even hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. Suppose there was a bowl of water that was mixed with dye, such as red lac, turmeric, indigo, or rose matter. Even a person with good eyesight, checking their own reflection, would not truly know it or see it. In the same way, when your heart is overcome and mired in sensual desire, even hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. Furthermore, when your heart is overcome and mired in ill will, even hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. Suppose there was a bowl of water that was heated by fire, boiling and bubbling. Even a person with good eyesight, checking their own reflection, would not truly know it or see it. In the same way, when your heart is overcome and mired in ill will, even hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. Furthermore, when your heart is overcome and mired in dullness and drowsiness, even hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. Suppose there was a bowl of water overgrown with moss and aquatic plants. Even a person with good eyesight checking their own reflection would not truly know it or see it. In the same way, when your heart is overcome and mired in dullness and drowsiness, even hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. 
Furthermore, when your heart is overcome and mired in restlessness and remorse, even hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. Suppose there was a bowl of water stirred by the wind, churning, swirling, and rippling. Even a person with good eyesight, checking their own reflection, would not truly know it or see it. In the same way, when your heart is overcome and mired in restlessness and remorse, even hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. Furthermore, when your heart is overcome and mired in doubt, even hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. Suppose there was a bowl of water that was cloudy, murky, and muddy, hidden in the darkness. Even a person with good eyesight checking their own reflection would not truly know it or see it. In the same, ta- in the, in the same way, there is a time when your heart is overcome and mired in doubt, and you do not truly understand, understand the escape from doubt that has arisen. At that time, you do not truly know or see your own good, the good of another, or the good of both. Even hymns that are long practiced do not spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. This is the cause, Brahman. This is the reason why sometimes even hymns that are long practiced are not clear to the mind, let alone those that are not practiced. There's a time when your heart is not overcome and mired in sensual desire, and you truly understand the escape from sensual desire that has arisen. At that time, you truly know and see your own good, the good of another, and the good of both. Even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced. Suppose there was a wall, a bowl of water that was not mixed with dye, such as red lac, turmeric, indigo, or rose matter. A person with good eyesight, checking their own reflection, would truly, would truly know it and see it. In the same way, when your heart is not overcome in mire and sensual desire, even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are not practiced. Furthermore, when your heart is not overcome in mire and ill will, even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced. Suppose there is a bowl of water that is not heated by a fire, boiling and bubbling, A person with good eyesight checking their own reflection would truly know it and see it. In the same way, when your heart is not overcome or overcome and mired in ill will, even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced. Furthermore, when your heart is not overcome and mired in dullness and drowsiness, even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced. Suppose there is a bowl of water that is not overgrown with moss and aquatic plants. A person with good eyesight checking their own reflection would truly know it and see it. In the same way, when your heart is not overcome and mired in dullness and drowsiness, even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are are practiced. Furthermore, when your heart is not overcome and mired in restlessness and remorse, even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced. Suppose there is a bowl of water that is not stirred by the wind, churning, swirling, and rippling. A person with good eyesight checking their own reflection would truly know it and see it. In the same way, when your heart is not overcome and mired in restlessness and remorse, even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced. Furthermore, when your heart is not overcome and mired in doubt, Even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced. Suppose there was a bowl of water that was transparent, clear, and unclouded, brought into the light. A person with good eyesight checking their own reflection would truly know it and see it. In the same way, there's a time when your heart is not overcome and mired in doubt, and you truly understand the escape from doubt that has arisen. At that time, you truly know and see your own good, the good of another, and the good of both. Even hymns that are long unpracticed spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced. This is the cause, Brahman. This is the reason why sometimes even hymns that are long unpracticed do spring to mind, let alone those that are practiced. These seven awakening factors are not obstacles, hindrances, or corruptions of the mind. 
When developed and cultivated, they lead to the realization of the fruit of knowledge and freedom. What seven? The awakening factors of mindfulness, investigation of principles, energy, rapture, tranquility, immersion, and equanimity. These seven awakening factors are not obstacles, hindrances, or corruptions of the mind. When developed and cultivated, they lead to the realization of the fruit of knowledge and freedom. When he said this, Sangharava said to the Buddha, Excellent Master Gotama, from this day forth, may Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone for refuge for life. So that's a good sutta to keep in mind when we're trying to learn chanting and memorize chanting. Taking on a chanting project to learn a long chant, like the Paddy Moka or something like that, it can be um, helpful because if we're lost in the hindrances, then we can very clearly tell because we can't follow the, the chanting, can't remember it. So now, do final Dhamma reflection is Ajahn Sona talking about sensual desire and just comment that he, he uses the word desire, but it seems to me he's talking specifically about tanha, sensual desire or craving, kamachanda, um, when he uses the word desire. That's how I understand it, at least. What is wrong with desire? This is the question people ask. Do Buddhists just want to throw a wet blanket on the party? Uh, the desire is celebrated usually in the world. You want things, you have ambition, etc. You, you, you love things, you're going to invest your energy and your intellect in achieving goals and so forth. Uh, how do you live without desire? Well, we have to look at the nature of desire, and there's two similes that the Buddha gives to help understand desire and its problems. The first simile is uh, regarding water, and the mind is compared to water, and the desire in the mind is similar to water with uh, dyes. You, have you ever seen gasoline on the surface of water from motorboat engines? These beautiful rainbow shimmery colors. Now when you look into that, you do not see clearly through the water. That very fine surface is distorting. So this is the nature of the how it happens, how desire happens. That simile of shimmering rainbow effects of beauty on the surface is how desire happens. There's another simile. Desire at wanting, longing, craving is like being in debt. And many of you can relate to this with your credit cards or your mortgages. There's a burden. When you're in debt, you're below full, you're in lack. The moment you want something is the moment you experience the lack of it. You just put yourself in debt. Now, some of you have managed to get out of debt, and what does it feel like when you finally pay off your credit cards, when you finally pay off that mortgage? Lots of people celebrate. Uh, it's a feeling of freedom. So this is a simile illustrating the feeling of desire. And the other one, the water simile, is the how desire happens. So the Buddha gives two similes, images. And these are for helping you to remember the nature of desire and how it happens. And then we can understand it. So desire is Mm, lack, a hollowness, a lack of contentment. So the opposite of desire is contentment. One is satisfied, one is full, 
one is complete. We might also say that the word holy in English, H-O-L-Y, is actually the old English spelling of whole, W-H-O-L-E. So this was the idea of the holy person was the idea of the whole person, one who apparently missed nothing, was full and content. It's a mystery to most people. How can somebody be content? Most people's ordinary psychology is to continuously make the mistake of going into debt. This is also the case worldwide <laughs> with the economy. Canadians, Americans, Europeans are all commonly substantially in debt. They want things now and they're willing to go into debt for it, but they live with stress. So this is the something to be pondered. Watch what happens when you want something. The next time you want something, how do you feel? And if you ever have hours and moments when you have forgotten to want something, how do you feel? Catch yourself being content. Compare the two states. Now, it's not that you're not going to do anything. You're not going to make an effort to get food. Even monks have to go on alms round every day to get food. Do you have to want to get food to get food? No. You, do you have to want to cross a room to cross a room? No. There's no feeling of lack or of uh, hollowness or anything. In order to motivate you to cross a room, you simply cross a room. It's the feeling of desire, of want, of craving that's the problem. So if we can get out of that, we can feel this incredible sense of uh, fullness, completion, ease. Now, when that happens, the mind rejoices. The heart, when we say the mind, the, the Buddhist word would be more like refer to your heart, the emotional element uh, rejoices. It doesn't take much. It's entirely possible for a person with few uh, material uh, possessions, such as monks and nuns, or any advanced uh, spiritual practitioner, to, with very few possessions, feel abundance, fullness, completion, which, if you have the secret of this, really never ends. And it has not to do with the mere getting of the necessities of life, such as uh, uh, food, shelter, clothing, and medicine. You don't need a lot of desire to go to the doctor or get, get an aspirin out of the cupboard. There's no element of desire, so this is what you have to reflect on. What is desire? How does it feel? And this is up to you. I'm, the Buddha nor I want to convince you of anything. We want to simply point it out, and you're going to have to convince yourself by merely observing, and you will agree. When you observe desire in yourself, you will observe deprivation and lack. And when you observe satisfaction and contentment, you will feel out of debt, full. The next aspect is to be careful of what you invest into the objects that you see. This is called the sign of the beautiful. Now, this is the shimmering rainbow of uh, iridescence on the surface of water that I was talking about, it distorts the real nature of what you're looking at. So when we see desirability in something, we misrepresent it to ourselves. We do not see it exactly as it is. We invest something, and this is called the sign in, in uh, Pali, it's the nimitta. The Buddha says, you know, monks, when you go into the village and so forth, do not uh, regard, give regard to the sign of the beautiful. Do not invent anything. Just see what is. You can explore this uh, in your own life. Go, go on a shopping trip. Go into a, a, a mall or something where normally you spend time pondering and turning over in your mind the objects of your desire. Try walking through the mall, looking at things, but not adding anything to that. See the object merely as it is. And you will come out the other side of the mall in a very different state than if you give high attention to the sign of the desirable.
the sign of the beautiful. Now we're not trying to make you live in a world that is dull and boring. What we're trying to do is demagnetize you. You are magnetized. And that's a problem. That means you're highly conditioned, um, attracted and repelled from things. And this is no way to live. It takes a lot of energy to live in a state of constant uh, attraction and repulsion. The repulsion is anger and hostility, the investment in the negative sign, the sign of the ugly, the repellent. This is also a function of the mind. It's not in the object, it's in your mind. And when it's in your mind, it's also in your body, in your emotional condition. So if you want to free yourself, you're going to have to raise yourself up out of this and feel what it's like to walk around just for an hour without the slightest bit of hostility and without the slightest bit of desire, just for an hour. See what it feels like to be free. You will start to prefer this. It's not something you acquire a taste for. It's something that immediately and instantly feels wonderful. Most people, it never occurs to do this. They think the beautiful, the desirable is out in the world. They don't realize what they're doing to themselves when they generate this, the, the, the debt and the lack that they produce. Just as the people who are not good at managing their money don't realize it until somebody pulls them aside and gives them a rational attitude towards this. So it's our own basic irrationality and lack of skill in the emotional dimension that produces the lack that comes with desire. This is what we want to free ourselves from. Our beautiful aspiration to true freedom, fullness, contentment, and undistorted perception of the world as it is. So this is a very brief thumbnail description of something which is pervasive and the, one of the primary blocks to your well-being in this very life.